Hello, AP Bio. Welcome to our video lecture for chapter 21, The Evolution of Populations. So the last two chapters, 19 and 20, have been a, a deep dive into evolution, um, particularly on a larger scale. Um, you might use the term macro evolution for that, sort of large scale evolution going from um, one species to another. This chapter is on what you might call micro evolution, which is um, evolution on the small scale specifically looking at changes in allele frequencies, which will take us into the, the Hardy-Weinberg theorem, um, which I know you're all very excited about Hardy-Weinberg. So the picture I've chosen to begin with for this chapter, um, this is the English peppered moth. And this is a, a case study um, from England back, back pre-industrial revolution. So before they had lots of factories and such, um, you can see there's two varieties of the moth. There's a dark colored moth and a light colored moth. And before the industrial revolution in England, the trees were covered with lichens. You can, you can go outside in your yard, you can probably see sort of light colored um, things. They're, they're called lichens that grow on, on tree bark. And with the lichens, the color of moth that blended in would be the lighter color. <clears throat> so the populations of, of the moths were heavily sort of pushed toward the light color. Well, the revolution happened and they had all the factories, they were you know, burning coal and putting out smog and pollution and the trees literally turn black. And in a short period of time, the frequencies of the dark moth went up and the light one went down. Um, skip ahead some years later when they sort of clean things up and the trees go back to being covered in lichens that are light colored, the population shifts back to the light color. So what we've been talking about with that example is how a population can change in the allele frequencies, in this case, dark moths versus light moths, and in sometimes a, a very short period of time. And the changes in allele frequencies is what we call microevolution. Um, another example I wanna go through, this is one from the book. So this is from an island called Daphne Major, and this is in the 70s. And you can see the, the finch, the bird pictured here. So they had a, a period of drought, and scientists were measuring, they were studying the average beak size, um, the beak, how deep the beak is of the finches. And before the drought, they were, you know, fleshy colored fruits, not fleshy colored, fleshy fruits that were um, very easy to eat. Um, when the drought hit, the only things that the birds could eat were basically um, dry seeds and nuts. And so having a larger beak would be better for, for cracking open seeds and nuts because it's usually stronger. And if you look at the graph here, after a very short period of time, only a couple years, the average beak depth went up from just under nine to close to 10 millimeters. Um, this would be another example of, of microevolution, the change in allele frequencies in a population. <coughs> Excuse me. So a couple of vocabulary words. So um, a population, this is not a, a new word to you, but the definition might be. So a population is a localized group of individuals belonging to the same species. So a population is the same species in the same place. So a population of dragonflies in South Carolina, a population of moths in England, a population of squirrels in New Hampshire. Same species, same location. A species, um, I'm not sure we've defined this word before, is a group of populations that have the potential to interbreed. So if you're in the same species, it means that you can reproduce. Um, typically, you can reproduce all spring that are fertile. There are some exceptions to that, like a whole horse and donkey make a mule, which we'll talk about that in a, a later chapter. Um, the gene pool is basically all the alleles for all the genes in a given population. So, you know, if, if we have a, a class of, of 20 students, how many alleles for eye color are in that population? Well, each of you has two. So a group of 20 students would, be have, would have 40 different alleles for eye color. Um, how many of them are blue? How many of them are, are green? How many of them are brown eyes? Like that's the gene pool. It's basically what, what's in the reservoir of genes in that population. Microevolution, I think we've already said this, is basically a change in allele frequencies in a population over generations. So with the peppered moths, you know, when the, when the dark colored moths became more dominant, basically the allele for the light color went down and the allele for the dark color went up, the allele frequency, I should say. So this takes us into the Hardy-Weinberg principle. And let me just say right now, um, there's a lot of math with Hardy-Weinberg. The math component of chapter 21, we're gonna do in class. Um, the P plus Q equals one, all that fun stuff. 
the video is not really going to address that because doing Hardy and Weinberg problems is, is better done in person. And I have a big packet of problems we're going to do, some together, some on your own. That part we'll do in class. The video is only going to cover the, the concept behind it. So Hardy and Weinberg were two scientists who basically describe a population that is not evolving. Um, there are five Hardy and Weinberg conditions, which we'll get to in just a minute. But basically, if, if any of those conditions are not met, it means the population is evolving, which means that the allele frequencies are changing. So saying that it's evolving, is, it, that means that the allele frequencies are not staying the same. If you're in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, the allele frequencies don't change from generation to generation. And if you look at this diagram here, this is from your book. So this shows the frequency of a red allele versus a white allele, whatever it is, don't just say it's red and white little marbles. Um, they have to add up to 100%, right? So the frequency is 0.8 and 0.2. This would be the, you know, the decimal form of, um, of a percent. They had to add up to one. So there's two choices, red or white. The frequencies had to sum to one. So if the red was 0.6, the white would be 0.4. And there's, there's 20 marbles in this box, so 16 of them are red, four of them are white, 0 0.8 and 0.2. Um, if this population, if this is the gene pool, if the population's in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, then when this population has offspring, um, you know, you produce again, it's egg or sperm, there'd be 80% chance of getting a red gene in the egg or sperm and 20% chance of getting a white one and then cross those and get the F1 generation, it's still gonna be 0 0.8, 0 0.2, all right? Now, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium really, it rarely, if ever, actually exists. It's more of a theoretical construct to explain why things do change. But the five conditions are, and these are the conditions to be in equilibrium, so these are the conditions to not evolve. No mutations, random mating, um, if, if, the, if the peacock's picking the peacock with the brightest feathers to mate with, that's, that's, that's not random because you picked. Um, no natural selection, extremely large population size, and no gene flow. Gene flow would be like people are coming in and out. If people come in and out of a population, you're getting new alleles or you're losing alleles. So no gene flow means the population is isolated. So if I asked you, or if the AP exam asked you to name the five conditions, you know, it's easy to get these wrong. The condition one is no mutations. If you write mutations, well, that's wrong. So the five conditions to be in, in, in equilibrium, no mutations, random mating, no natural selection, large population size, isolated, okay? The five things that cause evolution, mutations, non-random mating, natural selection, small population size, and not isolated, or you could say, uh, migration okay uh, make sure you have that right in your head like what does cause and what doesn't cause evolution so at this point we're, we're basically going to go through and again if I've said it again let me just say it again if you violate any of these you're not in equilibrium like you don't have to meet all of them um, I'm sorry you do have to meet all of them if, if you break one of them you're not in, in equilibrium okay um, one year I had a kid who thought you had to break all of them to be evolving, and no, you only had to break one of them. So now we're going to go through the things that cause microevolution. Basically, it's the things that break those five things. It's the opposite. So genetic drift. So let me ask you a question. So if you tossed a coin 10 times, all right, what are the chances that you would get um, seven heads and three tails. Now you should get five and five, right? But getting seven heads and three tails, that's, that's possible. Like you could randomly get seven and three. If you tossed a thousand coins and you got 700 heads and only 300 tails, that's the same percentage, right? But tossing that many coins, if it comes out 700, 300, your coin is weighted, right? There's something going on. So genetic drift is the idea that small populations random chance affects small populations more than large populations, right? That's why you do experiments more than one time because doing this experiment once, you might randomly get some weird result. Doing it a hundred times, like compensates for just random chance, okay? So this would be changes in allele frequency because the population is small. Let me ask it a different way. 
if if 10% of a population are redheads, what are what's the likelihood that they all die? So 10% of redheads, they're all gonna die. If my population's 10 people, that means there's one redhead. The chance of that one redhead dying, possible. If my population is a thousand people, then a hundred of them are redheads. The chances that all a hundred of them die, that just gets more unlikely because you have a larger size. So Changes in the population due to a small population size is called genetic drift. Think of like the frequency is actually drifting and they could actually result in, in allele being lost. If it's only in one person, that person dies, the allele is gone. So this is just a, a picture from the book. So here's my first generation of flower. Um, there's 10 flowers, there's red, there's pink, there's white. All, only five of them breed and I pick five at random and I only picked one red. So look what happened. My frequencies were 0 0.7, 0 0.3. Now they're 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Um, now only two of them reproduce, and I randomly picked the two red ones. Now the population is all red. So P is one and Q is zero, okay? So when you have a small population number, you can have wild fluctuations in allele frequency just due to random chance. Um, with some examples, the bottleneck effect. This is, if you have, this is like when you have endangered species. When you have a large population that shrinks down to a very small size for, for whatever reason, this picture from the book shows, it's called a ball neck because think of like you have a bunch of marbles in a bottle and you have a small neck and only like, what's that, six of them survive. Like the tan ones were all gone and you only got one white one just because you pick six at random. Um, small size, random fluctuations makes a big difference. Another example, the founder effect, is think about this maybe with people where you have a large population that colonizes like a small group like an island or a lake um you might have changes in allele frequency just because you went from a large population to a small population that small population if that then like grows in numbers the frequencies might be different from what they were originally because you neared it down to a small group um you could have had a higher number of redheads in that small group and obviously redheads tend to have kids with, with red hair, more so than other hair colors. So quick case study. So um, this is in the United States. So the greater prairie chicken, there's a picture of one right there, um, is native to um, sort of the middle of the United States. And in the middle, mid 20th century, um, their habitats were, they lost habitat due to basically humans coming and taking their environments. Um, in Illinois, you just had a, a, a massive plummet in the numbers of prairie chickens. And as a result, the birds that survived, only about 50% of their eggs were, were hatching. So what the heck was going on? Well, uh, this just shows Illinois, their range before the bottleneck or before you know, the, the bottleneck and then their range after, like poor, poor prairie chickens. So Illinois, between the 30s and the 60s, huge population size. This column right here, oh, and let me just note, in Kansas and Nebraska, there was no bottleneck. This is only in Illinois. So this column here, number of alleles per locus, this is basically like, like take the gene for eye color. What are the possible alleles for eye color? Blue, green, hazel, brown, black. It's just the number of choices for a given gene. This metric is a way of measuring the amount of genetic diversity. And species are better, they're more robust when you have more genetic diversity. So before the bottleneck, um, when you had lots of people, lots of chickens, 5.2, 93% of their eggs hatched. After the bottleneck, this should be a, I think that's a less than sign that didn't convert, right? When you only had 50, the, the genetic diversity, the number of alleles per locus goes down to 3.7, and only about 50% or less of the eggs are hatching. So the, the result of having less diversity means fewer of the eggs hatch. Look at Kansas and Nebraska that didn't have a, a bottleneck, and you can see the, the alleles per locus didn't change and most of their eggs hatched. Now, before I flip the slide, what's a way that you could fix this? Um, one year I asked this question and a student said, well, you could take the chickens and, and mutate their genomes to get more variety. And I'm like, yeah, that, that, that'll do it. Or you could just bring in more chickens take some of the chickens from Kansas or Nebraska and put them in a cage and take them to Illinois and release them. And that's basically what they did. Um, they, they took prairie chickens from other populations and just introduced them. And the rate of egg hatching went back up to, to 90%. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So 
this slide just shows a summary. So genetic drift is, is effective in small populations. It's due to random chance. You can lose variation. If an allele becomes fixed, that means everyone has it. And if it's a bad allele and everyone has it, that's, that's not good, right? Okay, so uh, the next cause of microevolution is called gene flow. And gene flow is just migration. That's when people enter a population or people leave a population and you either you gain new alleles or you, you lose alleles. This one's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, remember one of the, the conditions for hardy weimar equilibrium was no gene flow. So having gene flow or migration causes microevolution. Um, some examples, so um, things like mosquitoes. So West Nile virus is a virus that, uh, that mosquitoes carry. Um, usually, back in the day, we would use DDT, which is a chemical you would spray that kills mosquitoes, and DDT would help slow down the spread of West Nile virus or malaria or other, other pathogens that were carried by mosquitoes. Well, mosquitoes can be resistant to those. This is kind of the same example as the antibiotic resistance that we did in Chapter 19, I believe. So, you know, there could be a mosquito that's resistant to DDT. It's one mosquito in a billion. It, it, you know, whatever, it doesn't have an advantage. Well, you spray that pond with DDT and it's the only mosquito that survives. Um, let's assume two of them have resistance because they're, they're gonna mate. Um, those two then repopulate the population of mosquitoes. Suddenly they're all resistant to DDT. So West Nile malaria starts to spread. Um, insecticide resistance, like antibiotic resistance, um, you get that because we're picking which trait is more beneficial. So it's really artificial selection. So what if a resistant mosquito then flies to a new population? So you've had gene flow, and now that, that allele for resistance is now in the, the gene pool of a new population. Um, these next two are so short, I put them on one slide. So mutation and non-random mating mutations change the gene pool because the gene mutated. Like that's pretty self-explanatory, right? Non-random mating would be, remember the, the condition for, for equilibrium was random mating. Um, Non-random mating would be when you're choosing who you mate with. Inbreeding is just mating between closely related partners. Assortative mating is when um, you mate between partners who have similar phenotypes. So like if the, if the, um, the female peacock is picking the, the right male peacock based upon its plumage or whatever, um, you know, if you choose what you're mating with, you know, you're basically choosing which gene pool you're mixing yours with, right? So that obviously could, could cause mutations. If, if only the bright colored male peacocks mate, then over time, the population gets more brightly colored. Um, uh, this slide I already, I already said, basically, this was the DDT example, where using insecticides picks those that are resistant, the frequency of the resistance is, is going to go up. This slide, this is a case study from the book. We're gonna do this one in class. This is a super important case study. We'll, we'll come back to this. But just a word on mutations, you know, are they good, are they bad? No effect, you know, it, it depends where the mutation is, right? They could be bad, they could be good, they might have no effect. The second point here is the main point that I wanna make. So in terms of, of affecting the evolution of a population, if the mutation isn't in an egg or sperm and a gamete, it, it won't be passed on. So for example, if I, mutate one of my skin cells to become a super duper awesome skin cell that's great that might have improved my fitness but if that gene doesn't get passed on to the next generation through an egg or sperm it you know it, it doesn't get passed on um this is one thing we'll probably discuss this in class but the idea of of gene editing for for babies like creating designer babies this is a topic that we'll discuss in class um that's controversial because i mean it's, it's for many reasons but if you make an edit to an embryo, when that embryo grows up and produces offspring, the, the gene you, you change will be in its offspring too. So basically you're changing the human lineage for the rest of history, which is a huge deal. If you, you, know, if you edit a cell in my ear, once I'm dead, that mutation's gone, right? Because I didn't get passed on. Editing embryos, you know, Again, you're, you're changing the gene pool because if those embryos grow up to have offspring, they'll pass on the edited trait as well. We'll discuss that idea more in class. Um, mutation rates, this is interesting. So bacteria mutate slower than eukaryotic cells do. Um, and if you think about it, there's really two things that, that affect evolution in this case. It's how fast does DNA mutate 
and how quick are, are the generation times. Bacteria divide so rapidly, you know, in, in, in an hour or two, you can have, you know, one bacteria can be a bunch of bacteria. Humans, it takes, I mean, minimum, what, 15 years or so to get a, a new generation. Um, things that have longer generation times generally have faster mutation rates to sort of compensate for that. Things that have faster generation times usually have lower mutation rates because they, you know, you're going from more offspring quicker. Um, and just, just to review uh, other sources of variation besides mutation, this is from like chapter, the chapter of, on meiosis. Um, crossing over, independent assortment, random fertilization, these don't create new genes, but they create new combinations of genes. These, these big three, you should have these big three memorized. Crossing over, independent assortment, and random fertilization um, also shuffle genes to give you genetic variation. Diploidy, so you know, bacteria aren't diploid. They only have one, they only have one chromosome. So diploidy is an advantage because one, you have twice as many genes, right? Because you have two copies of each. Um, so you can have recessive alleles that are, that are hidden. Um, heterozygotes, you know, in a minute we're gonna go through the example for malaria, but because you can hide alleles, totally ever losing an allele, even if it's a really bad allele, in the heterozygous condition, you can have bad alleles, but they're hidden. So it's very, very hard to lose an allele in things that are diploid because you can hide it. And you know, e even bad alleles, we'll go through an example here in a minute, there might be situations where they might be good. So keeping the variation is, is a good idea. The example that, that I wanna go through is the, the concept is called heterozygote advantage. So balancing selection is just the, the trend, the phenomenon in nature where we want to keep both P and Q. Like we don't want P or Q to go to one. We want, we want them to stay both in the gene pool. Um, they deal with sickle cell anemia and, and malaria. So if there's a condition where being the heterozygote, being big B, little b, is actually the best thing to be, that would help preserve both, both alleles, right? So the deal with sickle cell. So sickle cell is, is a recessive trait. We've discussed this many times. It's, it's you know, you don't want to have sickle cell anemia. If you are heterozygous, so if you're, if you're homozygous recessive, you have sickle cell. If you're homozygous dominant, you don't have sickle cell. You know, you're fine. If you're heterozygous, you don't have sickle cell, but half of your red blood cells are the wrong shape, but you're, you're okay. You don't have the disease, but you're also resistant to malaria. So the pathogen that causes malaria, Plasmodium uh, falciparum, I guess is how you pronounce that. Um, it's a parasitic unicellular eukaryote. It's, it's, a, it's a pathogen that carries malaria um, through uh, getting bitten by a mosquito. Mosquitoes carry the pathogen from person to person. If you're, so if you have sickle cell, you're also resistant to malaria. The, the, the pathogen that causes malaria doesn't like the sickle cell shape of Red, or red blood cells. So if you have malaria, you also don't get, or I'm sorry, if you have sickle cell, you don't get malaria or you're, you're resistant to it, but you know, you have sickle cell. If you're heterozygous, you don't have sickle cell, but you're also resistant to malaria, which is like the best of both worlds. This picture shows the frequency of the sickle cell trait and look where it's more frequent. Um, and actually, yeah, the, the colors are the sickle cell allele and the little dots are where the pathogen that carries malaria is more common, generally in tropical areas where you have more mosquitoes. And this, this is not by coincidence. Like it's, it's nature has made it this way because having the sickle cell trait and the heterozygous form makes you resistant to malaria. So where do you find that allele? Where you have more malaria. You don't have lots of sickle cell trait in Norway because there's no mosquitoes there. Or the, or the mosquitoes that carry malaria definitely are not in Norway because it's too cold, right? So this is a case where the environment the temperature, the mosquitoes, has helped shape the allele frequency, in this case of sickle cell. Frequency-dependent selection, this is a, a cool example. So these two, this fish, the P. microlepis, these are sort of like scavenger fish, um, and they feed off the leftovers of this fish that they follow, and their left mouth or their right mouth. Um, and if you look at the graph, the graph is showing the frequency of left mouth individuals. So if there's 10 left mouth fish and you're the 11th left mouth fish you're probably going to be left out right 
um, no pun intended. If there's 10 left mouth fish and you're the first right mouth fish, again, you're the only person on that side, it's you're, you're by yourself at the buffet, you're doing great. So look what the frequency does. When the left mouth individuals here, it's about 0.6, that, that's getting too many, the frequency goes down. If it gets down to a point where there's very few left mouth fish, then being a left mouth fish becomes advantageous. And the green dots, I guess, are showing the frequency of the, of the right mouth fish. This is in your book. So depending upon what the population is, left or right, dictates what's most fit. That's called frequency dependent selection. Neutral variations, just a fancy word for saying variation that doesn't seem to offer an advantage, like fingerprints, lots of variation there. Doesn't have a, a slot of advantage. But again, the mechanisms that give us variation through meiosis are gonna be there whether our trait is advantageous or not. So I wanna talk for just a minute about the, the word fitness. So we've used the expression survival of the fittest before, and that's that's you know that's a fine expression, but it's a little misleading because it sort of does imply like two two critters are like directly competing. You know the the light colored moths and the dark colored moths weren't actually fighting each other; they they were competing through nature. So usually it's it's indirect competition for resources um, through like I say through nature. So if someone asked you for a, a definition of fitness or the term relative fitness is the same thing. A really short, easy definition is that fitness is a measure of reproductive success. It's a measure of reproductive success. And what that means is it's basically how much do you contribute to the next generation's gene pool, which again would be through successful reproduction. Two important points just to make. So selection acts upon phenotype, not genotype. So your genotype determines your phenotype, right? But nature doesn't know if you're big B, big B, or big B, little B. Nature acts upon what it can see, which is your phenotype. And selection acts faster on dominant traits than recessive traits. Um, yeah, okay. So last thing in this chapter. So there's three main modes of natural selection, stabilizing, directional, and disruptive. And this topic is sort of best taught through a diagram. So I'm gonna flip ahead for a second. So here I have a population of mice. They can be white, they can be light brown, medium brown, dark brown, or, or grayish black. And the original population has this sort of bell curve or this sort of light brown color or medium brown color is the most, most dominant. So what do you think dictates what color of mouse is best fit? Um, it's usually like what kind of soil or what kind of substrate the mice live on because mice get eaten by predators, particularly birds. Um, like owls or hawks or whatnot. So being able to blend into the soil or the whatever substrate they live on would be beneficial. So directional selection would be, look at the dash line. If, if the allele frequencies are moving toward a darker color or a lighter color, if you pick a direction and go that way, that's called directional selection. So say this population of mice lives upon very dark volcanic soil, this kind of mouse will be more fit, this kind of mouse is gonna be eaten really, really quickly because it's going to stand out. That's directional. Disruptive is when you, you don't want the intermediate, you want either type. So say that the mice, um, the, the substrate's multicolored. There's either, say you had recent volcanic eruptions, you either have areas that are dark or you had lava that hardened, um, or you have areas that are very, very light colored sand. So being a light color would be okay. Being a dark color would be okay. Of course, you need to be on the right substrate to blend in, but being the, the medium color is, is bad. That's called disruptive. Stabilizing would be only the intermediate is good. The, the extremes are not good. So say the mice live on um, medium colored sand in the desert, and that's it. If you're black, that, that stands out. If you're white, that stands out. So you wanna, you wanna stabilize what, what's in the middle. Um, a common AP question would be to give you one of these and ask you like, why? Why is it going that way? And basically you just discuss what color the ground is. So sexual selection would be natural selection in terms of mating success. So the idea that the brighter peacock gets the, gets the female peacock. Sexual dimorphism is just when you have marked differences between the sexes. Um, this picture kind of shows that. This is the male, brightly colored, lots of plumage. This is the female. Females are usually, in terms of birds, kind of drab in color. If they're the ones sitting on a nest, you don't want to stand out because a predator will get you. Whereas the male is usually brighter colored, this is sexual dimorphism, to, to attract the female. 
So here we had the male doing whatever little display he wants to do. This is the female looking back. I'm not sure she's convinced or not. Her expression looks like, I, I, don't, I don't think she's buying it. Um, but that's sexual dimorphism. So last slide, just, just to wrap up, just some, some reviews and some important points. Evolution, the goal of evolution is not perfection. The goal of evolution is to take what genes are already there and to pick which ones are, are best, which ones, actually not even best, which ones are better than other ones to create the set of genes that makes the organism best suited for its environment. Nature doesn't strive for perfection, it strives for better than what you might um, have now or what came before you. Um, evolution is by natural selection involves both chance and sorting. Genetic variations arise by chance. There's definitely an element of here of, of just random chance. And what, what selection does is it sorts the alleles as to what's the best fit for the environment. And the idea of, of adaptive evolution, this is just the idea that you want to increase the alleles that improve fitness, that improve reprodu reproductive success. And we just say this isn't on the slide, but last point, remember evolution doesn't happen on, on individuals. Individuals don't evolve. The mouse can't change its own color. The unit of evolution is the population. A population can change in terms of allele frequencies. Um, common, common AP question. The minimum amount of time, this is important, the minimum time that you need to see evolution, like what, what is it? Well, it's not a time as in a like two minutes, it's a time as in you need at least two generations. One generation isn't good enough. You need at least two generations to be able to measure and observe evolution. Okay, that's enough for one chapter. We'll wrap it up there. See you guys next time.